yeah okay hi everybody and uh, welcome to the second part of this talk uh, today my discussion will center around uh, of course first i'll prove the isoperimetric inequality then i'll talk about some functional consequences of the isoperimetric inequality i'll talk about some functional consequences and i'll also discuss equality cases specifically for the brun minkowski inequality which we proved last time along with uh, restricted versions of equality cases for the minkowski first inequality and for the isoperimetric inequality so bm minkowski's first inequality which we proved last time and the isoperimetric inequality that we will be proving this time so let me for for the sake of recap state the isoperimetric inequality again our version of the isoperimetric inequality is as follows if you have a lebesgue measurable set in some rd and it's a bounded set and you take a closed ball which has the same volume and if p in rd is a closed ball of uh, the same excuse volume me. yeah yeah can you reshare the screen i can't see it sorry can i Tanish, uh, sometimes yeah. when a, a pa online participant re-enters the room, they are not able to see the screen. So can you just share it again once more? Oh, sure. Just sure. Uh, sure. yeah, stop sharing and share it again. Yeah. Sure. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah, please verify that the screen is now visible. Uh -huh. uh, yeah, I can see the screen, but uh, it's uh, showing SI. I cannot see anything else. You cannot see the whiteboard that he's using? Yeah, yeah. Okay, well, uh, Amadeep, Amad, do you want to try re-entering? Yeah, maybe you can leave and re-enter the meeting. I tried happens. already that. So Okay, okay. Uh, so hang on, let's see. So maybe I can just ask Salvesh to do this once more. Sorry about this. Sometimes this yeah, happens. Sure. Just try sure. it again. Yeah, you carry on because it is uh, maybe it is a problem from my side. My device is not working properly. OK, 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 fine. So yeah. carry on. Yeah. yeah, sure. I'll carry on. OK, so if A is a Lebesgue measurable bounded set and if uh, B is a closed ball that has the same volume as A. Then the perimeter of B is less than equal to the perimeter of A. So the ball is the perimeter minimizer over all sets having the same Lebesgue measure and bounded. Right? And uh, last time, we didn't prove the isoperimetric inequality, but we came very close because we proved an inequality from, from which it will be a one-line corollary, namely the Minkowski's first inequality, which I will also state. So recall that Minkowski's first inequality, it involved a quantity called the mixed perimeter. So if you have two sets, K and L, which are Lebesgue measurable and bounded as usual, then you have the following inequality. So sigma of K comma L, which is the uh, 
mixed perimeter is greater than or equal to the volume of k to the well let's say they are subsets of rn so then n minus 1 by n and then the volume of l to the 1 by n and these are all n dimensional volumes so ah sorry sorry right right i'll keep i'll keep the index as d for this stuff instead of 1 Right. So, the first thing we will do in this talk is uh, finish off the uh, relatively easy task the, of proving the uh, isoperimetric inequality from Minkowski's first inequality. So, we claim that the uh, Minkowski's first inequality, it implies the isoperimetric inequality. We claim this. And the proof is fairly obvious, actually. What you do is, if you have, you know, a set A, if you are given the A, then you realize that by definition, by definition of the perimeter, if uh, let's use the notation B1 for the ball of radius 0, 1 in RD, by definition, the perimeter of A is actually nothing but the mixed perimeter of A with respect to ball of radius 1. And on the other hand, the same thing applies for B, where B is a closed ball with the same volume as A. So if B is a closed ball with the same volume as A, then we also have the same relation. We also have, you know, sigma of B is sigma of B comma B1. However, this is where the paths diverge. You see, in the first inequality above, Minkowski's first inequality will tell you that it is greater than or equal to the volume of A to the D minus 1 by D times the volume of B1 to the 1 by d. On the bottom, you can verify by definition of the, the mixed perimeter that in fact it's equal to the volume of b to the d minus 1 by d times the volume of b1 to the 1 by d. So you can actually verify by the definition of the mixed perimeter that this is an equality on the bottom, the second one, whereas the first one is an inequality. So you know, because the volumes of A is equal to the volume of B, the isoperimetric inequality follows. Because these two quantities here are equal. And once they're equal, the mixed vol the perimeter of A is greater than or equal to the perimeter of B. So we have shown that the isoperimetric inequality is true, at least our version of it. So once we're done with this, we will now start looking at some functional consequences of the isoperimetric inequality. And the first of these, the first of the functional corollaries, not the corollaries, one of the sort of functional variations of the isoperimetric inequality that we will see is called as the Sobolev inequality. So the version of the Sobolev inequality that we'll be sketching a proof of is not the most general version of the Sobolev inequality because we'll be using a particular identity that is uh, not applicable on the entire domain of the Sobolev inequality. However, we'll still be showing that the isoperimetric inequality in some sense implies the Sobolev inequality. So you'll be proving a version of the Sobolev inequality using the isoperimetric inequality. So, to do this, we need to think about, well, the first thing that we do is we recall that the isoperimetric inequality had this particular corollary. So there was this corollary of the isoperimetric inequality that we stated last time. That corollary was that 
you know, if you have a set E, that's a subset of RD, that's bounded measurable. Then uh, the perimeter of E is greater than equal to some constant depending only upon D times the volume of E to the D minus one by D. So this was a corollary that we mentioned last time, and this can be derived in one line from the isoperimetric inequality. So it's, it's, all, it's pretty much, you could even say it's equivalent to the isoperimetric inequality. So uh, what we do is here, we will try to now kind of think of both sides of this inequality in terms of functions. Yes, C of D will be volume of B1 to the one over D. So C of D is exactly, so the question was, what is the value of C of D? It's exactly the volume of the ball of radius one in dimension D to the power one by D. Yeah, that's basically because in Minkowski's first inequality, if you think about it, right. So uh, how do we think about, you know, this inequality and how do we put functions into this particular corollary, right? The idea is to think of indicators. If you have sets, have sets, then those sets have indicator functions. And the idea is how we think about, you know, Lebesgue measure and so on, for example, is that we start sometimes thinking about indicator functions, then we go to simple functions and then to general functions, right? So that's a motivation to think about indicators. But in this case, because we have a set-based inequality and we want to upgrade it to a function-based inequality, the idea is that we go from a set to its indicator and then want to see if we can somehow go from the indicator to a general case. So let's now, let's draw a set. I don't know. Let's, let's draw a set like this, perhaps. It need not be convex, any set. Let's call this set as some E, right? Now, if you look at the indicator of E, uh, let's, uh, for, for the sake of uh, for the sake of ease, let's assume that E contains its boundary, so that the boundary is contained in E. Whatever's inside, you know, the entirety of what's inside, you'll find that the indicator is one, and everything outside, you'll find that the indicator is zero. So, if, and this is a big if you can give a meaning to the quantity grad 1e. If at all this had a meaning. Now this is not, of course, indicator e is not like, is go, not going to be differentiable. But if at all you could give any kind of meaning to it, then it is likely that it would only change values at the boundary of e it is going to change values or going to be non-zero. Actually, the, the gradient, so to speak, is going to be non-zero only at the boundary of E. And once you see this, you think, okay, what is the sort of natural way to you know, think about the perimeter and you realize that the perimeter can be thought of. So this is not a, this can be made rigorous for smooth, con smooth convex bodies, but uh, we can think of the perimeter as the L1 measure of this gradient. So the perimeter of E can be thought of as the L1 measure of this gradient. And now, on the other side, if you think about the volume, the volume is, and, and this is not even a correspondence, it's literally exactly this, it's just the L1 norm of the indicator. In fact, not only is it the L1, I mean, yeah, it's, exa it's exactly the L1 norm of the indicator, right? So, what you would expect is that there is some relationship between the perimeter and the volume for sets, and this can be upgraded to a inequality for functions using this kind of a correspondence. 
so can we push this correspondence forward right and how do we do that well let's look at the uh, corollary again so the corollary said that you know it said that the perimeter of e is greater than equal to the volume of e to the d minus 1 by d now if you think about the volume of e to the d minus 1 by d it's actually nothing but once you adjust the l properly once you adjust the power on the l properly it's just indicator e l d by d minus 1 so on one side you have the gradient of 1 e yeah i'm sorry yes yeah, so, so the question is there's a, there's a c of d involved i forgot to put that right so on one side you have grad indicator e l1 and on the other side you have the l d to d by d minus 1 norm of the indicator so there is this l1 of the grad versus the l d by d minus 1 of the function and this is the content of the sobolev inequality so let me state a theorem so the, so this this inequality that i'm going to state it's not it's a restricted version of the full sobolev inequality but while proving the inequality that follows this we will actually derive the whole version anyway so this version of the sobolev inequality states the following if d is greater than equal to 2 and let's assume that f is a good enough function for now the domain of f can be extended if necessary but we will assume that f is a smooth function then indeed this kind of l1 versus ld by d minus 1 type relationship holds so if you have the l d by d minus 1 norm of rd this is less than equal to some constant depending only upon d times the l1 norm of grad provided the right hand side exists i'm sorry provided the right hand side is finite not the, not provided the right hand side exists so i won't be giving a completely rigorous proof of this the point is i talked about grad 1e and the natural question is okay how am i even going to talk about this particular quantity when it's not differentiable well the theory behind that is something that i cannot give you but i can definitely give you a reference for it so a good reference to see for example how you can give meaning to such sets is to look at the uh, book by francesco maggi which is titled sets of finite perimeter and variational problems so for example if you look at say theorem 13.1 in that particular section you'll see that what's going to come now is actually uh i'm going to be talking about roughly proving something called the coarea formula in the next 5 minutes and theorem 13.1 is the most general version of the coarea formula so the coarea formula can actually be proved for all lipschitz functions but we stuck with c infinity functions for the sake of this uh, talk right so now the question is we want to prove the sobolev inequality so we want to prove the sobolev inequality from the isoperimetric inequality so if you think about it how do you again go from a set to a function you take indicators right and if you are thinking about the l1 norm of a function and you want to relate the l1 norm of a function to some sets involving it then you are naturally inclined to think about the layer cake formula so layer cake formula what is that that is the following so here is a well a heuristic proof of sobolev
one can think of this as isoperimetric implies sobolev so this is a you can say that the sobolev inequality is a corollary of the isoperimetric inequality by making what i'm saying below rigorous right and the answer is as follows uh you start with let's say some function u greater than equal to 0 right so let some function u greater than equal to 0 now the layer cake formula will tell you that you can write u of x as integral 0 to infinity of the indicator of u greater than t of x dt well actually this isn't the layer cake formula but this is one heuristic way of thinking about the function u of x and uh, provided the grad intuition that we gave above kind of goes through so here is a big if if this goes through and suppose you can you know differentiate under the integral and so on then you can think of grad u of x as integral 0 to infinity grad indicator of u greater than t of x dt and uh, this is so, so this is nice we've basically managed to express the grad of a function in terms of something involving that function's level sets the question is can we do a little better it turns out that we can do a little better here's how so if u is any general function any any function so it need not be sort of positive or something any function then you can write u in terms of its positive and negative parts. So u plus minus u minus. That is always possible. And what you can do is you can check that you can check that if you are try to apply this logic. Uh, well, you actually have an explicit formula for u plus, right? So u plus is nothing but well, it's by definition, it's nothing but max of u comma zero but if you are trying to differentiate it or take the grad of it you would it's better to think of it as this formula mod u plus u by two so think of it this way and real and remember you know the derivative of the absolute value function wherever necessary then you will actually realize that the uh, derivative of uh, the grad of u plus can be written as the grad of u on the set u greater than zero and zero otherwise. So once you actually differentiate this and use the absolute value and the chain rule and so on, you will actually realize that this is the case. And repeating this with u minus, you will just get, well, u less than zero and so on, right? And once you do all this, sorry? No, it's outside. Okay, so the question is, is the product of gradient, you know, the, the indicator inside or outside the gradient, it's outside. So yeah, I should put the brackets and ensure that's the case. So it's zero. So for example, the grad of u plus is zero if u is less than or equal to zero, and it's equal to grad u if u is greater than zero. So now once you add these, you know, you can verify just by adding these and doing some more basic algebra that in this identity here that we wrote, you know, the second one, this one that I've marked as star, in this identity, I can actually get in absolute values with an equality. So generally, you know, because of the triangle inequality, the grad will kind of, uh, not the grad, the integral, when you take a, you know, absolute value inside an integral, you typically get an inequality. But in this case, because of this kind of correspondence, you can actually verify from star that this kind of inequality holds true. So this time you can go from minus infinity to infinity as well. Yes. So now this thing that you can see here on the last line is actually true for any function u. So earlier we started with u non-negative, but now this identity is true for any function. This identity is now true for any function. Uh, now what you do is, once this identity is true, 
then to derive what we call as the co area formula you integrate both sides with respect to x so now you integrate with respect to x yeah no that still doesn't have a meaning we're still working in the heuristic sense it's true in a heuristic sense it is not so the question is that what is the sort of actual meaning of this equality that we've written here the answer is that it's true at least as far as our working is concerned in a heuristic sense the rigorous interpretation of it for example can be found in maggie's book what that particular equality is can be found in maggie's book so once you integrate both sides of this with respect to x what you get is on the left hand side you will get the l1 norm of gradu and on the right hand side what you will get is you will get integral over rn rd rather we are working with d integral from minus infinity to infinity to infinity of grad indicator u greater than t of x dt now we can suppose we we can because you know the integrand is non negative so we exchange the integrals and then realize that what's coming inside is just the perimeter yeah there is a i'm sorry i had forgotten a dx while doing the double integral so we end up getting the perimeter surprisingly at the end of all this and now if you see both sides of the inequality here both sides of the equality here so if you look at you no know, grad u l1 and you look at the other side you realize that at this point there is no sort of heuristic any kind of indicator or something like that that's going on so the equality between these two quantities that you see here for all c infinity functions u it is in fact true and this, this is called as the co area formula so the co area formula rigorously assigns the l1 norm of u to a particular integral involving the perimeters of the level sets of u so this is a very interesting formula and using uh, this formula we can now prove the sobolev inequality how because we are actually already ready to apply the isoperimetric inequality we have perimeters so we may as well start applying them right so just to write down the co area formula once again properly the l1 norm of grad u is the integral from minus infinity to infinity of the perimeter of u greater than t dt now let's directly apply the isoperimetric inequality what do you get you will get some constant depending upon d integral minus infinity to infinity and you will get you know the volume of u greater than t to the d minus 1 by d dt and once you get this what's inside now if you notice this volume of u greater than t to the d minus 1 by d that's nothing but the l d by d minus 1 norm of an indicator so you just get the indicator of u greater than t that guys d by d minus 1 norm dt and now because the norm inside is greater than equal to the norm outside you can pull the entire norm outside and the inequality still holds true now i'm just going to put a, a a bit of a caveat on this inequality i'm just going to put a c here because this inequality is important and we'll come back to it later this kind of norm getting pulled outside type of inequality so once the norm gets pulled outside what do we get we get a uh, indicator u greater than t dt and finally l d by d minus 1 but then whatever is inside is just u
and that finishes the proof so sobolev's inequality one ah yeah sorry 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 so the question is one of these inequalities that we that i've written here is actually an equality it's this one the norm always works with the integral that way right minkowski's integral inequality says that so minkowski's integral inequality states that you can uh, pull a norm inside an integral and that is greater than equal to the norm of the integral itself so you can pull a norm and uh, you will you will get a bigger quantity yeah just think of it as triangle inequality but with an integral instead of a sum yeah and the reason why i have written a capital c there is because we will ask ourselves at some point of time the question when is this quant when is this equality when is this inequality that we write here capital c an equality we will ask ourselves that question right right now there is another corollary another i mean it basically speaking a corollary of sobolev but it looks like a much stronger inequality and it is this is the inequality that allows you to vary the indices so you see here in the sobolev inequality we are comparing the l1 norm of grad u to the l d by d minus 1 norm of u so now somebody might ask i don't want to compare the l1 norm maybe i want some l3 norm or something like that so the question is how much can i vary these indices right and that is the content of the theorem of gagliardo and nirenberg and just as a just as an aside the actual co area formula in maggi is proved using something called the morse sard lemma so you prove something called the morse sard lemma and then uh, you kind of start with smooth functions then you approximate we approximate lipschitz functions by smooth functions and then you do this plus minus type approximation so anybody who should who wants to kind of start reading that should start reading up the morse sard lemma right so we will now state the theorem of gagliardo nirenberg so let's assume for now that we have a function that's c infinity of rd and uh, we'll start with numbers q greater than r right and what we want to do is we want to control the l qth norm of u in terms of the lrth norm of u and a particular some quantity p the norm of grad u so this is this is how that works it will work as follows given you know these quantities if you pick any p that belongs in this interval r i'm sorry you don't pick up p in this interval you pick a p such that q belongs in this interval so dp by d minus p so if you let p go close to d if you let p go close to d then the right end point that you see here goes to infinity so you can pick p close enough to d so that this particular inequality is satisfied and with that p you can get the following kind of control you can find a theta 1 well okay no theta 1 just theta there will be a theta that will be strictly between 0 and 1 which depends only on pqrd that's that okay and 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 a constant of course and a constant that will again depend only upon pqrd such that the following kind of inequality holds so you want to control the uh, l qth norm of u what you will get is that of course with this constant you will get the l rth norm of u and you will get the l pth norm of grad u this is exactly what you will get
so what i'll do is i'll provide i i won't provide the entire proof i'll just say at this point that what you do is you first uh, if once you're given u you first sorry oh oh my god i'm so sorry i i i missed a theta theta in the inequality excuse me. i missed a theta in the inequality yes now you can see the inequality as properly written so some theta that will depend upon pqrd but those powers will appear in the grad and in the norm respectively so the proof essentially goes via applying the holder inequality twice so if you are given a function u then you can kind of apply you know so the first thing that you can do is you apply sobolev inequality to a power of u a suitable power of u and you apply the holder inequality so once you so you do this once when you do this once provided your power of u is chosen properly you will actually get the following in intermediate inequality which is actually the full sobolev inequality so the full sobolev inequality is the following the full sobolev inequality which is basically that if you take the l tp by d minus p th norm of u that's less than equal to some some other constant say some c prime which depends only upon p and d times the lp th norm of gradient so this is like one level generalization right yeah I'm missing something. No, it has to be integrable. You have to make sure that u is integrable. You have to make sure that u. Okay, so the question was, what happens if u is constant? Well, u has to. You have to make sure that the L, Q, and L R norms exist on R D. So you can't be taken as a constant function. Yeah, sorry. Right. right sir so the full sobolev inequality is where you can at least get this much variation for a particular value of p and then it turns out that you apply full sobolev along with another holder so you can apply another holder so to speak so if i i mean something like this will also hold in bounded domains yes no just give me a second okay so the question is the following the question is what if we are on a bounded domain and we are considering the gagliardo nirenberg sobolev inequality then if u is a constant it seems like the right hand side is zero while the left hand side is non zero so can this be uh, reconciled perhaps i'll keep this for the next session okay so this will be kept for the next session but if anybody has an answer they are free to suggest in the meanwhile thank you so you apply um, another holder what was support. the point service i mean we can't have constant and compactly supported right uh, i mean yeah um, no the no the question is exactly the following the question is that if you take the gagliardo nirenberg sobolev inequality what uh, happens when you are on a bounded domain Huh. and uh, the same kind of inequality holds but uh, you are you have a constant function then okay. 
yeah so perhaps the gagliardo nirenbach sobolev inequality it will hold for functions that vanish on the boundary or something so the appropriate sobolev space so to speak will be will have that zero on the bottom like a w012 or something like that of omega so probably the uh, way to reconcile this gagliardo nirenbach inequality is that the appropriate domain for it is a sobolev space which is uh, constrained to uh, for so that the function can be extended beyond the boundary by zero Yeah, no, I didn't see the problem. So, uh, oh yeah, Sarvesh, uh, so Kaushik has a comment. No, 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 yeah. Sarvesh. In that yes. case, the gradient will not uh, that will not be zero, right? It will live on the boundary or something. So, how can? Uh, If it's constant, the gradient will live on the boundary. Yeah, that contribution also has to be taken. That's the point. Ah, uh, I see. The comment is that the gradient can also be there on the boundary if the function is constant. So, are we thinking the function which is one on the domain is yes. zero outside the domain? That's right. That's right. The function one on the domain and zero outside the domain clearly ah. Gagliardo Nirenberg has written cannot apply to it. So, how is that reconciled? right but still the grad is zero right grad is no but it's your grad for the indicator that you had earlier right so <clears throat> that will come ah right right yeah yeah what i'll do is next time i'll uh, i'll i'll get a sort of the 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 whole statement of gagliardo nirenberg you know in the sobolev space situation i'll make sure that i bring it and at least state it properly next time so that we can rid ourselves of this confusion although my guess at the moment yeah sure i'll probably post it on the teams group and uh, we'll make sure that we can get rid of this confusion right but right now all we should realize is that the ho applying holder inequality twice from the sobolev inequality gives you the apparently stronger looking but in fact equivalent gagliardo nirenberg inequality now the questions we can ask is you know now we can start talking about the equality cases so we've shown that the you know if we start talking about the brun minkowski inequality we can kind of move across so we can be like okay we've seen the equality cases of the brun minkowski inequality for example can these be transferred to minkowski's first inequality and then can these be transferred to the isoperimetric inequality Sorry, why so are this, the proofs and the inequalities in the middle yeah no i think uh, i mean this maybe everyone has seen it but all these uh, inequalities that are uh, that you have written down i think it might be useful because all these indices dp by d minus p and all these things uh, it's useful to think of why why these uh, constant show up just by you can just look at uh, taking u instead of u you apply it to scaling of u u of tx then you will see why those constants come up right uh, if, if you if at all you expect some inequality like that you would think of v applied to v equal to u of tx then you will see that the index has to be of a certain kind for this uh, these inequalities to hold so i mean right, these are really right, standard right. but uh, any anyway. okay okay so so you are saying that the idea of understanding why these indices occur is to uh, at attempt to uh, try and see this appropriate scaling for the inequalities right yeah only then yeah. you will see only for a specific kind of uh, constants you can have those inequalities you, you can't just have any lp any lq right so all these inequalities you just by taking scalings you can see what what are the possible constants you will you you can get Yeah, that's right. That's right. That's right. That's right. So uh, we will now go to the equality cases of the Brun-Minkowski inequality. and the equality cases of the brun minkowski inequality well it's mostly well understood 
but uh, we still have troubles with sets of measure zero. So I'll just give you like a very simple example. So first of all, what what, what is an equality case, right? So what is an equality case? Well, x plus y to the one by n. If the volume of x plus y to the one by n is equal to the volume of x to the one by n plus the volume of y to the one by n, then this we consider as an equality case. So recall that we stated the Brun-Minkowski in two or three different forms. The second form of those was the so-called superadditive form, and the equality case of that superadditive form is what we are calling as the equality case for us for the Brun-Minkowski inequality. So. How do we think about the equality cases of the Brun-Minkowski? For that, let's go back to our proof. Let's go back to our proof, right? So if you go back to our proof, the first thing we started with were X and Y were so-called SCPs, right? Standard closed parallel operators, right? And if you recall the inequality there, we actually used an AMGM inequality. We used a particular AMGM inequality. So, for example, if x was say zero comma x one cross zero comma x two cross up to zero x n, and y was zero y one up to zero y n, then we actually saw while applying the AMGM that we applied the AMGM to the following quantities. We applied the AMGM as follows: there was this particular product, you know. I equal to one to okay. I'm sorry. I'm sticking with dimension d, so I'll just change the n to d everywhere. That's just irritating. So I equal to one to d, x i by x i plus y i. We had this particular quantity, whole to the one by d. This was there, and then what we did was by the AMGM inequality, the one by d came down, and we got a sum instead, right? I equal to one to d. X i by x i plus y i, and there was an analogous term where the y i was on top. We uh, added those quantities and we got back one, and that's how we proved the uh, Brun-Minkowski inequality for SCPs. However, when is this quantity an equality? Now, equality for the AMGM inequality happens precisely when all the terms are the same. So, equality here happens. If and only if the x i plus x i plus y i is independent of i. However, this is the same as saying that x i by y i is independent of i, just by a simple algebraic rearrangement. And what is x i by y i being independent of i mean? It's just that the fact that one SCP is actually a homothetic image of the other SCP. So, for example, if you have a rectangle with sides one and two, let's say X is a rectangle with sides one and two, it probably means that Y is a rectangle with sides two and four, for example, or three and six. So, that kind of reasoning also permeates to unions of SCPs, as you will see. So, you've seen that for SCPs, there is a natural reason to expect that homothetic behavior between bodies will come into play. And what does this word homothetic mean? Just to define this, two bodies X and Y are homothetic. If you can find a vector. That 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 acts like a translation vector, and you can find a factor that acts like a scaling factor. That's that x is equal to e y plus, right? So the idea is that under translations, the equality doesn't change because that's what we saw last time, right? We saw that the Brun-Minkowski inequality is. Uh, it stays the same under uh, translation, so translations don't really affect anything, and scaling also, as it turns out, doesn't affect anything. At least as far as what we've seen in terms of the equality. What happens for unions of SCPs now? Now we've already seen that for SCPs, homothetic equality comes in. What happens for unions of SCPs? 
here we can be a bit clever recall the uh, hadwiger uman cut right so for example l- let me illustrate by a diagram how homothety comes into play here right what we'll do is we'll we'll try an inductive argument so let's assume that you know the homothety type reasoning goes through for all m you know let's say x and y where the number of boxes in x plus the number of boxes in y is less than equal to some quantity and then we try to, we go one further and that's when we apply the hadwiger uman cut right so for example let's say that the thing i've drawn on the bottom is x and let's say that whatever is on top is y so let's say this is y right now the red line that i have drawn in the middle here this is a hadwiger uman cut and y it will be kind of adjusted so that you can apply you know the next step of the brun minkowski uh induction that was done in that particular step so this is a let's say some hadwiger uman cut now if you look at this cut this cut recall it divides the left hand side into you know some x plus x minus and the the right hand side into some sorry the other body also into some y plus and y minus following translation and then we apply brun minkowski to x plus y plus and then to x minus y minus now if we assume inductive reasoning then equality in brun minkowski inequality for x and y will also imply equality in brun minkowski for x plus y plus and for x minus y minus so if x comma y are a brun minkowski equality case then because of this hadwiger uman logic x plus y plus and x minus y minus are also equality cases and by let's say inductive reasoning let's assume that x so we will get that x plus y plus is homothetic so let's say that x plus is some i don't know lambda times y plus or something like that and let's assume that x minus is some delta times y minus or something like that sorry oh sorry 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 i've been asked to change my color i'll do that just a second just a second lambda lambda yeah question yeah that's intentional so i've made x and y look a lot like each other that's intentional because i'm going to show on that they are homothetic right i'm going to show that they are homothetic if they are an equality case so that's why from the diagram i'm i'm trying to already reflect that so i so x plus and y plus are kind of homothetic and x minus y minus are also homothetic if we are, if we are apply the induction case however hadwiger uman cuts are not unique there is more than one way to do a hadwiger uman cut so for example i'll just translate x and y to make delta and lambda actually equal to each other and how do i do that i just push x up and make it kind of horizontally next to y so if you look at the next diagram things will become extremely clear so now here is your next hadwiger uman cut and uh, this time y will be here and x will be here sorry i'll draw that in black and x will be here but now if you see again we've got a different hadwiger uman cut and uh, a different we can't really have different scaling constants now so now we'll have a different you know some x prime minus and x prime plus and we'll have a y prime minus and a y prime plus but then if you see from this diagram y prime plus and y prime minus and x prime minus will have to also be an equality case so y prime minus and x prime minus will have to be an equality case and that will imply because of the 
our previous arguments and because of this diagram that delta is actually equal to lambda so what i'm trying to say what i've just mentioned everything here will tell you that if you have a union of scps then the hadwiger uman cut and its non uniqueness will tell you that even unions of scps will reflect the same homothetic type reasoning so you will get homo you will get that x and y are homothetic question sarish yeah so this hadwiger cut uh, what you show is in the Isn't it that it exists in one of the axes? Here you seem to be saying that in every axis you can find a Hadwiger cut. Yes, actually, it turns out you can. So the question is, well, I've just produced another Hadwiger Riemann cut. How did I do that? Uh, it turns out that you can modify that argument. So I'm not being very rigorous here, but it turns out that you can modify that argument. If you recall the proof of the Hadwiger Riemann cut, I just took two boxes and the relationship between them. I can actually take any two boxes. and uh, mm -hmm. apply the same logic that i applied there to show that there is a hadwiger riemann cut relating to those two boxes and therefore there is no need for this hadwiger riemann cut to be unique and if you take the hadwiger riemann cut it need not be unique but if all the boxes are stacked on top of one another for example let's say in the they all have the same uh, x projection for example then ah, it wouldn't work yes then then it wouldn't work but even though if the point is in that case you will actually see that x and y are scps up to measure 0 itself so the question is what if you know the boxes are all stacked on top of one another or something like that then x and y themselves are boxes up to sets of measure 0 oh, well then it not be quite exactly like that okay uh, what i mean is that okay i, I don't remember exactly but uh, this what you are saying requires uh, hadwiger cut in every axis or at least two different axes what this ah, proof it requires it at, in at least two different axes or you should make sure that your homothetic constant sort of match across all boxes right okay so this requires a little bit of an argument i'm being pretty imprecise at this point but anyway okay. you can but, show that this logic works what question yeah. you see you were second picture does not appear to be hadwiger cut to me because according to hadwiger cut one box should be on one side another box should be on the other but if you look at your second cut it is not a hadwiger cut you see ah you're right you're right you're right there has to be one box less on one side you're right you're right right you're right Right. right i should i should have started with a more representative diagram yeah you're right mm -hmm. i should have planned this out better yeah okay yeah okay but uh, uh, i i hope the gist of the argument is fine so what i've drawn here is actually not a hadwiger roman cut i'm sorry so this is a, unfortunately a wrong diagram but it still ends up representing the situation in the sense that right. you can kind of move x prime and y prime around and produce more hadwiger roman cuts just so that you can get this equality between these homothetic constants so yeah you just take boxes you know you take three boxes that's fine oh you mean to say on top uh, yeah. oh, sorry you can cut delta into two parts so think of three boxes ah right 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 yes yeah right right yeah so it's not a hadwiger cut as drawn but you can easily modify the situation so that it becomes one right but essentially speaking what i'm doing here is i'm providing a heuristic argument as to why we should expect homothetic behavior to come in so if that is kept at the back of the mind we are in good shape now the other the other thing that we should observe is the role of is what con, is what role convexity plays so convexity plays a role here actually how does convexity play a role here convexity plays a role in the following way let's say you have a set a okay and let's say a is convex now if you take a is convex then it then the way it grows has a certain pattern so for example if this is a then this is 2a for example now if you look at a concave set if you look at a non convex set so to speak then you'll see that when you try to apply brun minkowski between it and a scaling of itself then things will start to fall apart so let's take a typical example of a which is an scp let's say i don't know 
A is perhaps an L or something like that. It looks like an L, right? So let's say this is A. A is clearly non-convex, right? What happens when you look at A plus A? A plus A, as it turns out, now what should happen if A somehow satisfied Brun-Minkowski equality? If A satisfied Brun-Minkowski equality, then the volume of A plus A to the power 1 by n should be equal to twice the volume of A to the power 1 by n. However, in this diagram that I draw, you'll see that A plus A contains 2A. It kind of contains 2A and more. So what will happen when you do A plus A is let's, let's, let's do the pasting argument. You know, the, the pasting definition of the Minkowski sum. So when you do that, what do you get? You'll kind of get L's at at each point, right? You'll kind of get, uh, you know, an L here, then an L here, then you'll get an L here, and so on and so forth, right? And it travels across this boundary. And therefore, once you paste, what you will get at the end is that you will get something like, this. You'll get something like this. And if you look at what A plus A is, A plus A will just be this particular quantity. So this, everything here will actually be A plus A. And this quantity, I'm sorry, not A plus A, this whatever's inside will actually be 2A, excuse me. This is like A scaled twice, and this extra part is kind of created by a lack of convexity. So you can clearly see that if A is non-convex, and in this case, we saw the simplest type of non-convex set. It's an L, so it's literally an SCP. Non-convexity kills the potential for Brun-Minkowski equality to happen. So non-convexity of an SCP actually implies that it can it cannot so two of its scaling. So let's say of an SCP A implies that lambda A and mu A cannot be equality cases of Brun-Minkowski inequality by this kind of logic that I have mentioned here, which you can try and generalize to more SCPs. So this is a nice visual picture as to why non-convexity is a problem. And therefore, we would think that convexity and homothety are the two key factors to keep in mind when we are thinking about equality cases of the Brun-Minkowski inequality. Now here we have a theorem. So I have given you now the two main sort of parts, the two main uh, sort of key factors to keep in mind when you think about equality for the Brun-Minkowski inequality. And uh, to, to first, just before I define this theorem, I need to make two definitions, both of which are fairly standard. The first is the convex hull. So if you're given a set X, the convex hull of X is the smallest convex set containing X or the intersection of all convex sets containing x. And the second definition is as follows. If you have a point, if you have a function, if you have a set x, you know, what is a sort of good point inside x? It's what you call a point of density 1. And uh, that points of density 1, as it turns out, will matter. So given, let's say, small x in big x, X is an interior. So in this, this definition of interior point contradicts with the topological definition, but this is, how, this is the phrase that is used in that particular paper. So X is an interior point if the following limit exists and equals one. So on the bottom, you have the volume of ball of radius x epsilon 
and on the top you have x intersection ball of radius x epsilon. So you can kind of think of it as this is an interior point in some sense. So with these two definitions, what we have seen so far is that convexity and homotopy play a great, great role. Now, if you have a convex set, then it can be approximated by SCPs in such a way that the convex, the sort of lack of convexity will go to zero. So that's the way to think of this result. That uh, just is one there. question. Just yeah. one question. You yes, say, sir. why did you demand little x belongs to capital X? If you took, for example, punctured disk, okay, the right. origin is not in my set, but it is an interior point. Yes, it is an interior point. So I can take punctured disk, you see. So zero doesn't belong to my set, but still. No, in the, so the question is that X to be an interior point in this definition, it's not even necessary that X needs to belong to capital X. However, right. in this paper, it is assumed that X belongs to capital X because we try to reconcile it as much with the definition of the usual topological interior point as possible. Oh. Namely, the X epsilon should con be contained inside X. Oh, thanks. We try to reconcile it as much as possible. Yeah. So this result that I'm going to state, it is... Uh, in the following uh, paper, it's in the paper of Henstock and MacBeat. Okay, sorry, the ball, of, so this B of X epsilon, what is it? It's the ball of radius epsilon around X. No, I'm just taking the usual ball, right? The usual ball will always have Levinas, right? Oh, if capital X is lower dimensional, right? Eh? Yeah, right. If capital X is lower dimensional, there will be no interior point, right? So the question is, what happens if uh, X is lower dimension? Then do I take a lower dimensional ball? No. If X is, for example, contained entirely in a hyperplane or something like that, it will have no interior points according to this definition. So the definition of, so the uh, result of Henstock and MacBeat is as follows. So, the, so their paper is called On the Measure of Some Sex. Yeah. A point? See, every every topologically interior point is definitely interior according to this definition. But you can have some other issues. You can have some other points which are kind of, you can have some really weird things happening, like some kind of irrationals, you know, irrationals intersection 0, 1, then any point will be like an interior point. You can think of something like that. Though. If I may make a remark, this is what is called Lebesgue point, right? It is Lebesgue yeah, this is point typically what is called as a Lebesgue point. This is typically what is called as a Lebesgue point, if I'm not wrong. Yeah. Right. So if you if you look at the result of Henstock and MacBeat, that is as follows. So equality for x comma y, that is to say, in the sense that we had, that is to say, you know, the volume of x plus y to the one by n is the volume of x to the one by n plus volume of one by y to the one by n. For the case when x and y have volume greater than zero. So there is a case when one of them has volume equal to zero, but that I'm not going to discuss because the intuition behind that is a little more difficult. Then, sorry, I mean, equality holds if and only if the following hold, right? So if x star, x lower star is the set of interior points of x and y star is the set of interior points of y, then you'll find that X needs to be contained in the closure of X star. Y needs to be contained in the closure of Y star. And X 
star closure and y star closure are homothetic convex sets yeah that's right that's right you start if you are assuming x y are convex uh, no no i am not assuming x and y are convex in this okay 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 i am not assuming x to x and y are convex in this so this is i think theorem 2 from the paper if i am not wrong theorem 2 actually henstock and macbee deal with a slightly different version of brun minkowski but uh, theorem 2 of this paper is equality for that case suitably adapted by me for this uh, to 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 give this particular result so the if you want to study specifically for convex sets if you want to look specifically for brun minkowski for convex sets so equality when x comma y are compact and convex sets then what you need to do is you need an argument that specifically involves convex sets in a lot in a little more detail actually it turns out that even the argument of henstock and macbeth uses convex sets to be precise it will use the support function uh, facility of convex sets argue certain particular volume related inequalities but uh, this book convexity by uh, webster his section 6.5 you can find the following theorem So the theorem is that if x comma y are compact and convex subsets of R D, then they are equality cases. If and only if one of two things happen: either they are homothetic, or they are contained in parallel hyperplanes. So there are two hyperplanes. which are parallel to each other such that x is contained in one of them and y is contained in the other so this this second condition is something that comes from trying to calculate the volume of a convex set by projecting it onto various uh, hyperplanes and so on so this uh, oh. theorem is very very integral i mean it it uses the fact that you know x comma y are convex in a very important way Oh, but wait a minute. You see, when you say x is contained in a hyperplane, measure of x is zero, right? Yeah. So as it turns out, this particular theorem that I am writing here even captures the case where x and y could be measure zero. No, but it seems to capture only that case. Yes, that's right. So if x and y are in fact bodies which are compact, convex, and of measure non-zero, then in fact they are homothetic bodies. Ah. Okay. Uh, that is what the content of this theorem is and it also says that if x and y are measure zero then there are two hyperplanes such that one is contained in one the other is contained in the other and they are parallel hyperplanes it is one or two or yeah one or two ah okay yeah okay oh. sorry right so this theorem how much time do i have 5 minutes please okay so this theorem that you see here is a uh, kind of the brun minkowski equality case in some sense and uh, corresponding to this you can try and kind of push it on kind of push it you know using the proofs that we have made to corresponding proofs of corresponding equality cases of the uh, minkowski's first inequality and isoperimetric inequality using the inequalities that we've proved but we need to tighten them at certain points so we have been a little bit loose at some points especially with regards to measure zero considerations so once we tighten up those measure zero considerations or we assume convexity so minkowski's first inequality the equality case is typically stated only for convex sets and in fact the result is that in the case of convexity so in minkowski's first inequality 
equality holds if and only if well equality for x y convex for x y convex of non zero measure holds if and only if they are homothetic and once you come to this step you can then generalize that step to the isoperimetric inequality where in the isoperimetric inequality you will get something like if x is a closed set for example so how how would it look like for the isoperimetric inequality for the isoperimetric inequality so the so typically for the isoperimetric inequality we have two options one option is to be very loose but the other is to put as many assumptions as necessary to ensure that the ball is the only minimizer right so for example one such thing would say something like if x is convex and there is a ball such that x has the same volume as it and x has the same perimeter as it then x is homothetic to the ball so x is also a ball of some radius no of the same radius as b perhaps translated so this is the equality case for the isoperimetric inequality and i don't have time unfortunately but otherwise i would have discussed the equality cases for the sobolev and gagliardo nirenberg inequalities yeah just before i leave this capital c inequality that i have written here the reason why this is very important is because this is the point where the isoperimetric inequalities equality cases stop transferring to the sobolev inequality at this point when i exchange the norm with the integral the equality case of so this but the particular inequality that i have used here is minkowski's first in, is minkowski's integral inequality because i have in exchanged you know the integral with a norm so it can be thought of as like a integral version of the triangle inequality this inequality when it holds that kind of breaks the entire logic here so you it doesn't hold for any c infinity function u it will only hold when u is the indicator function of a particular set and unfortunately indicator functions are excluded from our version of the sobolev inequality because we have restricted ourselves to c infinity functions and also because the co area formula only holds for at most lipschitz functions at the worst at the best sir so because of that the particular inequality c breaks the back of this entire chain of inequalities and that means that we have to tackle the equality cases of sobolev and of gagliardo nirenberg in a completely different way which i'll probably give like a brief discussion on next class thank you any questions i'll clarify the proper statement of gagliardo nirenberg on finite domains next time yeah uh, just one question yeah sure you see going to henstock's thing if you have two compact convex sets contained in parallel hyperplanes they yes. is also contained in another hyperplane right that's right x plus y will also be in a set of measure 0 it will also be contained in another hyperplane in a, hy in a hyperplane actually right yeah yeah that's right that's right therefore that will be correct i see yeah uh, that that statement will be correct so that but, but the problem is there is no way that i can discuss these without for example introducing at the least what a support function is so uh, otherwise i would have wanted to even discuss these but there is no way that i can do that i can provide heuristics of course but th there i don't have the time so. by the way if you go back to that sobolev inequality that c p q r d some complicated thing right yeah. okay ah. so if we took logarithms is it saying that something is convex or no somewhere if we take logarithms then i don't think so see the problem oh. is the relationship between theta and pqdr is mm. it's oh sorry theta that... depends on okay okay ah not very but okay okay all right yeah yeah that theta is actually you can determine it because once you do ah. 
will realize that theta comes from deciding what the proper holder uh, indices need to be how it needs to be properly applied and so on so the relationship between theta and pqrd can be made easily explicit hi thickness of cp of constant for gagliardo nirenberg is a question that's actually not fully known so it's actually not fully known the equality cases of gagliardo nirenberg but some cases are known so hmm. some very special, special cases are known yeah and by the way the cases of equality is yes. it trivial to understand in case d equal to 1 If d equal to one, the isoperimetric inequality makes no sense. So that's why I had to stay. No, no. I, equality in the uh, Brun-Minkowski thing, which simply means Lebesgue measure of a plus b, Lebesgue measure of a plus Lebesgue measure of b, right? Right, right. Is it easy to understand dimension one? A, b should be intervals or something or no? I don't know. Yeah, sure. They should be intervals. So uh, the idea of understanding the equality case for the so for dimension equal to one, if you're trying oh. to understand equality cases, you might want to look at the more discrete version of the uh, inequality. So there is a discrete version of Brun-Minkowski for uh, for the uh, d equal to one case. It's called as a Cauchy-Davenport inequality. Uh -huh. So look at the Cauchy-Davenport inequality. This inequality. Is a kind of discrete version of the uh, Brun-Minkowski inequality in dimension one. I see. And if you look at the equality cases for that, that will kind of look like intervals. Mm. And it will be very clear from there what the equality cases are because there's mm. nothing that goes on there. So. Right, right. Yeah. Let me quickly write that down. So Cauchy-Davenport inequality. That's what that that inequality is called. Mm. You can prove Brun-Minkowski in dimension one by looking at the logic of the Cauchy-Davenport inequality and extrapolating it from it. Mm. One question, uh, Savesh. I mean, uh, it's uh, kind of the because of the equality case. Uh, so if you go down to your equality theorem for compact convex sets. Uh, Yes. So, as a particular point, it is saying that if I have two, say, let's say, if X and Y are measure zero compact convex sets. Yes. And they are not lying in parallel hyperplanes. Then yes. X plus Y must have positive Lebesgue measure. That's right. That's right. Is that, I mean, is that up very clear? I mean, I cannot picture it. That's why. I don't, yeah, yeah. That's not clear at all. So, the question is, if you look at uh, case two here, and uh, if you have two measure zero sets, which don't lie in parallel hyperplane, but which are compact convex, then according to this theorem, their sum will have measure non-zero. So is that something that is visually obvious? And uh, no, it's definitely not visually obvious to me. Yeah, maybe you can get two lines and they uh, the pipe or something. In each. Yeah, in case of lines, I can kind of imagine some kind of web ah, forming. Right. I mean, right. a web like. Uh, correct, correct, correct. Right. Yeah, you can take two perpendicular lines, for example, and add them. Yeah, that case, I that's the only case I can Im somewhat yeah, imagine. Yeah, the only imaginable case. But otherwise, yeah, it's pretty difficult to imagine in high dimensions why this would work. Why why this would give a non-zero measure strip. Right. So in in four dimension, maybe you want to do something else. Take two squares or something like that. Yeah, prob probably that that line logic can be extrapolated to you know higher dimensions. So mm. that is not necessary. I don't think that is necessary. Anyway, all right. Thank you.
so at least can you just once announce that you, you you'll be talking next week as well right so maybe you can just yeah. uh, so my next lecture will be uh, on the 19th which is which is next wednesday and that will uh, talk about symmetrization so symmetrization is a particular geometric technique that can be used to prove the brun minkowski inequality so next talk is on symmetrization yeah so this symmetrization is the steiner symmetrization so there are a couple of symmetrizations available there's another one by schwartz as well so that is a kind of radial symmetrization also minkowski right so i'll talk specifically about steiner symmetrization next time 19 october 2 o'clock afternoon all right yeah. thanks Thank you. Uh, and also all the recordings and lecture notes are available on the team's page uh, if you want to access them. Yeah. All right. Thanks a lot, Savish. Thanks. Sure. Thank you.